So thank you, Zainab, for uh, inviting me. It's my first time in Columbus, so I'm happy to be here. And let me just set this up. So I'm going to be talking about a uh, work that has unfolded in, the, in my lab in the last uh, five years. And uh, these are all the students and uh, postdoctoral students that were involved in this research. And a lot of the work that I'm going to be describing today is the work of Jesse Gomez, who finished uh, last summer his PhD in my lab and now is a postdoc um, with, with Kevin Weiner at Berkeley. So um, I'm interested in studying uh, how the brain achieves uh, visual recognition. And visual recognition is achieved by a cortical processing hierarchy extending from uh, early visual cortex all the way down to the ventral surface of the brain or ventral temporal cortex. So this is an example brain that's inflated of an individual subject. You can see the um, temporal lobe here on the bottom. I guess you can't see my pointer. Uh, the temporal lobe on the bottom. So suppose you're looking at this face. Light gets reflected from the face into your eye, and images form on your retina, and then information is relayed from the retina through the optical nerve to the LGN, and then to V1, and then through a series of processing stages across a series of retinotopic uh, regions, uh, information reaches the ventral temporal cortex, which is a cortical expanse spanning the collateral sulcus, fusiform gyrus, and occipital temporal sul sulcus, and maybe you have a percept emerging there you recognize this as Michael Phelps. And now, a ventral temporal cortex is not a homogeneous piece of tissue. And in fact, Nancy's group has a, a discovered that there are several category selective regions within this cortical expanse. So what we do is we typically identify these regions in each individual brain by showing them an experiment we call it in our lab jargon, the localizer experiment, in which subjects sit in the scanner and see in short four-second blocks uh, many images from different categories. For example, we have images of faces, bodies, objects, places, and characters. So from each domain, we have two uh, subcategories. And uh, we, this uh, experiment is uh, available in GitHub. You can feel free to download it from our web lab website. And we spend a lot of time calibrating the stimuli. So across categories, we've controlled as much as we can any kind of low-level confounds across these uh, stimuli. So typically, a subject will participate in three runs of this experiment. And then we could use some of the data to localize these areas and another set of data to independently uh, measure responses. So if you put a participant in the scanner and show them this kind of study, and you can contrast activation, let's say, between faces and other stimuli, um, you typically find uh, very consistently in each subject's brain uh, regions that activate to particular categories. So for example, um, in the lateral aspect of the fusiform gyrus, there you find typically two patches that are responsive to faces more than other stimuli, as shown in the beta responses. And we call them M-fuse and P-fuse for their anatomical location. And they're usually lumped by people like Nancy as it's a fusiform face area. On the collateral sulcus, it's about two centimeters more medially. You'll find an activation that is stronger for places compared to uh, other stimuli. And throughout the talk, I'm just going to label the region by its uh, location, like collateral sulcus, and its category selectivity. And finally, in the occipital temporal sulcus, we typically find uh, two patches um, in the posterior and mid uh, OTS that respond more strongly for characters uh, than uh, other uh, stimuli. Importantly, we can identify these uh, category selective regions in each individual brain, and we can identify them even in our youngest participants, like in these example, five and six-year-old participants. And moreover, in children like in adults, they have the same uh, functional organization across the cortical surface, meaning that in children, you'll also find the face selective activation in the lateral aspect of the fusiform gyrus, and their place selective activations in the collateral sulcus. So because we can identify these regions in each individual brain, and also as they're present in young children, the ventral temporal cortex is a really excellent model system to examine how specialization arises in the brain across development, and how the specialization might be linked to structural changes as well as behavior. So I'm going to show you data from uh, three studies today, and each of these studies is aimed to answer a different kind of question. So the first study I'm going to uh, ask 
is how does brain structure develop and ultimately lead to functional improvement. In the second study, I'm going to talk about how receptive fields uh, develop in the human ventral stream. And in the third study, I'm really going to address this issue of the topography, what kind of uh, statistics on the visual stimulus might give this consistent topography that we can measure across individuals. So in order to test developmental questions, uh, our lab uh, uses a, a cross-sectional uh, paradigm where we compare brain activation in children to that of adults. Our children are school-age children. They range in age of 5 to 12. Most of our children are from 5 to 10. We have um, uh, most of them in the younger ages. And as a control, we have uh, young adults. So in order to obtain really good data from the kids, we really need to keep them uh, still and motivated in the scanner. So we have a, a mock scanner in which we train the children to be still inside the scanner. Uh, and also to acclimate to the scanner environment, we scan them across several sessions. So the first session they come, they watch their favorite Disney movie and get an anatomical MRI. Uh, and then they come and do another session in which we do a bunch of functional MRI experiments that I'm going to describe as I go. Additionally, we get quantitative MRI data. I'm going to explain what that means. Uh, and after they've done several sessions of scanning, we do them, uh, we collect behavioral data in our lab uh, without any uh, MRI uh, machines. And I, it sounds very easy when you're giving a talk, but if you're a graduate student, that means that you've been collecting data for a very long time. So I do want to, one of the things that we're, we're scan, strong is not scanning thousands of people. We don't do that because we do individual subject analysis, but we've obtained many different kinds of data on the same uh, person. Another thing that you might want to be concerned about is about the quality of data. So we analyze each day subjects in their native brain space. We don't do any sort of special smoothing. We don't put anybody into any kind of templates. And we use independent data to localize and evaluate brain structure and function. And critically, because we're comparing across different cohorts of people, we test and verify that there are no between age group differences in uh, measurement quality and signal to noise or motion. So we are very confident that we can get high quality data in our child participants. So the first question is the following. How does brain structure develop and ultimately lead to functional uh, improvement? Now, in the neuroscience literature, there are two competing uh, theories that are anatomically motivated about what might happen in your brain throughout childhood development. Probably a very famous theory that you might have all heard about is the theory of pruning. And this idea of pruning is that initially you're, you're born and you have a lot of uh, connections and a lot of synapses, and brain development is really associated with pruning of unnecessary synapses and, and connection. And this uh, theory is based on data from a uh, postmortem analysis, like this kind of data from uh, uh, Pascal Rakik and colleagues, who published a paper in 1986 showing that while initially the number of synapses in V1 grows after birth, there is a sharp decline, and basically this decline is what is thought to be this pruning uh, process. And people have hypothesized that this, uh, pruning of unnecessary neurons, synapses, and dendrites might improve the function because it uh, reduces the responses to irrelevant stimuli. So maybe at the beginning, your brain responds to everything, and as the irrelevant stuff gets pruned, it only responds to things that it's supposed to be specialized for. An alternative theory is a theory of growth. And this theory of growth is a proposing a really opposite mechanism. And this theory suggests that brain development is actually associated with growth of dendritic arbor. So maybe in the beginning, the, uh, the baby's uh, axons are not very arborized. And then through development, they expand. Uh, and so there are going to be more connections, more synapses, and more dendrites. And this is an example data, again, has come from postmortem studies in the monkey brain that gives rise to this theory. So this is data from a different part of the brain. So this is V1. This is TE. TE is an inferior inferent temporal cortex of the monkey, and it's supposed to be somewhat homologous to human ventral temporal cortex. 
And you can see that in this region of the brain, uh, this is an example of a dendritic arbor, and this is, you can see the synapse counts, and you can see from the age of two days uh, and four and a half years, this is where a macaque monkey is an adult-like, you can see that the size of the dendritic arbor uh, really expand, and the number of synapses really uh, uh, grows. So this shows that in at least some other part of the brain, there is maybe an opposite process that might happen across development. And maybe the functional consequence of this growth is increased responsiveness to uh, relevant stimuli and maybe increased spatial pooling as the uh, dendrites become uh, more uh, expanded and long and bigger. So this is really nice, but if you're thinking about the scale of these things, this is a scale of microns and smaller if you're thinking about synapse. And I'm going to show you uh, MRI data. So how in the world am I going to use MRI to address these kinds of series that are with development? So uh, I'm not going to sacrifice any of my uh, participants. Uh, and I'm going to do everything with in vivo studies. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to use new methods that have been developed with fMRI. Not with fMRI, in MRI that are called quantitative MRI. and what we want to look is see if we can see any changes to the cortical tissue in a resolution of millimeters that might be coming from microstructural changes to the tissue happening at the micron range. And how can we do that? So uh, first, let me explain to you what this is a quantitative uh, MRI uh, uh, scan. Quantitative MRI scan is kind of like a T1 scan, except that instead of having a T1 weighted scan, we're actually measuring the decay of the T1 uh, and we get measurements that gives us real units, for example, seconds. So this is an example of a T relaxa T1 relaxation time of a cortical slice. And you can see that the darkness here of the voxel corresponds to the actual T1 relaxation time. So if you are, let's say, in a ventricle when there's a, not a lot of tissue, it's mainly liquid, you can see that there's a very long T1 relaxation time in the order of four seconds. And, but if you're in the white matter where you have very myelinated fibers, a lot of uh, lipids, you get a very short T1 relaxation time. For example, typical T1 relaxation time is in white matter of 0.9 seconds and lower. And so it's really important that this is in, in real physical units because that means that you can compare across individuals, kind of like how you take a thermometer and measure a person in, uh, temperature, you can compare that number uh, uh, across individual because it has real meaning in real units. So how does, it, how does T1 relaxation time relate to microstructural tissue properties? So this graph is a graph from Aviv Metzer who developed these methods when he was a postdoc in Brian Rondell lab at Stanford. And he measured the T1 relaxation time, again in units of uh, tissue, compared to actual macromolecule tissue volume. And this is from brain data, but he actually did it in, a, like, um, in vials where he actually controls the amount of lipids uh, in, in, the, in the sample. And you can see that the more, you, the more tissue you have in sample, especially my, uh, uh, tissue with lipids, macromolecules, you have a shorter T1 relaxation time. And this is like inversely related. So, now that we know this relationship and we know what we can measure, we can go back to our developmental hypothesis and see how we can use this method to look at these two uh, anatomical hypotheses. So according to the theory of pruning, initially you have a very dense brain that has a lot of uh, connections. So if you're a, a proton uh, and uh, precessing in this environment, and, and so, uh, sorry, and across development, you should have pruning or meaning you have less tissue in your voxel. So if you're a proton that is processing in this uh, environment, there's less tissue to exchange energy with um, as an adult compared to a child, and therefore you should get an increase in the T1 relaxation time from childhood to adulthood because there's less tissue to exchange energy with um, in adulthood. However, the gross hypothesis uh, posits the opposite phenomena that from childhood to adulthood you're going to get an increase uh, in the microstructural tissue and therefore a, a, a proton uh, processing um, in the adult tissue should have more tissue to exchange energy with and therefore we predict that there should be a developmental decrease in the T1 relaxation time. 
So basically what we would need to do to test these series is measure the T1 relaxation time in cortex in children and adults and to see if we get in any developmental changes. If so, we get an increase in T1 that would be consistent with the Prusing hypothesis or a decrease in T1 that would be consistent with the Gross hypothesis. Okay? Okay, so this is what we did. We brought our 25 children and 25 adults to the MRI. We first used a fMRI, a, an anatomical scan to localize their face in place selective regions. So I'm going to talk today about P-fused faces in collateral sulcus uh, places. Um, and basically, once we have this uh, area localized, what we can do is measure the mean T1 uh, in children and the mean T1 in adults and compare between the population. So this violin plot shows the mean T1 relaxation time in the face selective region in the light color of the children, in the darker color in the adults, and we can see that there is a significant reduction in the T1 relaxation time from childhood to adulthood. And you can see this not only in the mean response, but if you look at the histogram of T1 values in children and the T, sorry, T1 values in children in the lighter color and the T1 values in adults in the darker color, you can see that the whole uh, um, graph shifts to the left, meaning that there are significantly shorter T1 relaxation time in adults' face selective regions compared to the children. And this is consistent with the prediction of the gross hypothesis. If we look at the, yeah. This is my next. Uh, graph. So, uh, of course, we have the same question. Is this something that happens overall or is this is very specific? So, a good test area is to look at the place selective region, which is in the collateral sulcus and is about two centimeters more medially in the face selective region. And again, we measured the uh, mean T1 in children and the mean T1 in adults, and here we don't see any significant development, neither in the mean responses or in the distribution of responses. So this suggests that there is differential development of tissue properties across high-level visual cortex, and this is going to be a scene that's going to be emerging in the, my talk, that the face selective regions have a typically, have an atypically or specific prolonged development, and that's true both of their structure and their function. So this is really nice uh, that is a, there is, a, to our knowledge, the first measurement showing that there is development of the gray matter is that can be measured in vivo, but does this uh, brain development impact brain function in any way? So what we can do is measure in each individual their mean T1 relaxation time in their face area and then measure uh, also some functional property of that region. So one way that we like to characterize uh, functional properties of face selective region and measure their selectivity to faces, which is basically often characterized as a T value showing how much it responds more strongly to faces compared to other stimuli. And you can see that that would be a discriminator to show how much it shows preferential responses to faces. So basically, this is the data relating uh, uh, functional selectivity to faces compared to T1 relaxation time. And each dot in this graph is a participant where children are shown in circles and adults are shown in uh, diamonds. And you can see that there is this inverse uh, and significantly negative correlation that the shorter T1 relaxation time somebody has, the higher their selectivity uh, to faces. So it looks like that there is a uh, significant relationship between structural development and functional development. Uh, you can also see that the children are intermixed with the adults, so children that have more adult-like T1 also have more adult-like selectivity uh, to faces, and you can run this correlation when you partial out age, and you can again see that this correlation remains significant when the age is factored out. So. Um, this relationship is significant in the face area. Selectivity in the face area is not correlated with structural properties in other parts of cortex, like the place area. And also, if you measure the selectivity to places in the place area and the T1 relaxation time, you find no correlation. So basically, in a region that we don't find a structural development, we also do not find functional uh, development. So this is really pretty cool because it shows that Structural changes are also tied to functional changes in the same brain region. Yes? So how 
So in this particular analysis, we measure that each individual's uh, face selective, and we have a size, and the size is bigger in adults from uh, children. So uh, we were concerned with that as well. So we did a control analysis in which in each person, we just set a constant size disc. That disc was said to be at the average size of the child region, and we repeated this analysis. And numerically, the numbers are like slightly different, but the results still hold. So this is a valid concern, and we need to control for that. Yes? Did you try any voxel lab analysis within subjects such that some voxels would be uh, more selective for faces and you check a few other relaxation times? We did that. Um, we did this analysis a long time ago. I just don't remember the result. One of the things that we were really worried about, and this is where we did voxel bias analysis, if it has to do something with the curvature of the cortex, so maybe the fusiform is on the gyrus, the collateral sulcus is on a sulcus, and maybe some differences in the curvature might impact T1 relaxation time. So this is where we did this voxel bias analysis, and that doesn't really predict. So curvature, I'm sure, doesn't predict, but we. I don't remember what is the result if we look at within an individual subject, if we correlate within an individual, if the T1 also changes within an individual. It's an interesting question. Okay, so we see structural changes, we see functional changes in the face area. Does it have any uh, uh, impact on recognition behavioral abilities? So a test that is used often in the field of face recognition to measure people's uh, ability to recognize faces is a test developed by Brad Duchesne and Ken Akayama originally using adult faces. It's called the Cambridge Face Recognition Memory Test. You can do it online if you want to know how well you're doing in face recognition. We use a version of the test that was developed in Brad Duchesne's lab that uses children's faces because we were worried that there might be an other age effect and children will not do that well at doing adult faces. We have actually both versions of faces. They do do better in face and children. So everybody's doing this face test on using child faces. Basically, you're, what happens in the test, you're getting familiarized with these six child faces on the top. And then after you get, you see them in different views and so on, you get a, as a recognition phase in which in each trial you'll see three faces and you're supposed, you don't see the faces on the top anymore. And then you're supposed to say which of these three faces is one of the faces that I've seen before, and as the tests progress, as the trials become more difficult because they're shown with noise and um, uh, different lighting conditions. So basically for each individual, we now have a behavioral score of how well they're doing with face recognition, and then we can see if it relates to their structural properties in the face selective regions. So in this graph, I'm going to show you a correlation between the mean T1 relaxation time in the face area and uh, face recognition uh, uh, performance. And again, we can see this very clear uh, negative correlations where people that have shorter T1 relaxation time in their face area do better at face recognition. And again, this uh, test remains significant after we factor out uh, age. And face recognition processing uh, ability is not correlated like in T1 properties in other regions like the place area. And again, in the place area, uh, where we correlate instead of face recognition ability, place uh, recognition memory, there is no correlation between um, um, a behavior and T1 relaxation time. So it suggests that the specific structural and functional development in this region of the brain uh, is coupled with improved uh, behavior across time. So uh, I've shown you some data showing um, evidence for a, a cortical growth, but you might wonder, there are a lot of sources, microstructural structures in the tissue, which one of them actually might uh, affect um, our T1 signals? Maybe more cells are born in the adults, maybe they're more myelinated, maybe it is a story about dendrites being more uh, bigger and more complex. So um, one of the things that we notice in our data is that if you compare the T1 relaxation time of the face area in red and the place area in yellow, in adults are differentiated. So the adult face selective region has shorter T1 time compared to the, uh, to the place area, but in children that, they're not differentiated. So basically that suggests that there are different tissue properties in adult brains uh, in the face area and the place area. And one hypothesis you might um, put out 
is that lower T1 in adults face selective region is because there are more maybe cells there than in the place selective region. And this is what happens across development. And so what we could do is maybe leverage what we know about adult cytoarchitecture properties in these regions and see if we can see any cytoarchitectonic properties that might give rise to these T1 differences. So another set of studies that I've done was Kevin Weiner. We looked at the relationship between face and place selective regions and cytoarchitectonic partitions of the uh, ventral temporal cortex. So one of the things that we found that our face selective region, uh, P-fused spaces, is within a cytoarchitectonic region called FG2, which was discovered by Katrin Amutz and colleagues in Germany. And uh, as a place selective region is in a different um, cytoarchitectonic uh, region called FG3. So we collaborated with Katrin Amos and Carl Zillos, and we measured the cell density across layers in these cytoarchitectonic regions. And basically, this is captured by this uh, index that they call gray level index, which really tells you the density of cells across depths. So if you thought that the lower T1 in face selective region is because of more cells, you should have a higher GLI index in the face area than the place area. So we extracted the gray level index in the face area. We extracted the gray level index in the place area. And you can see that it's going in the opposite direction as our hypothesis. Actually, the place area is more cell dense than the face area. So this, what this tells us is that we do have a development of the T1, but it's probably not coming from neurogenesis. Yes? Yeah. No, 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 sorry, this is, this is Katrina Amos. Yeah, so this, they have 10 postmortem brains that they do these analysis in 20 micron slices. So the, the gray level, uh, is, there should have been scale bar, but this thing is like. So this is postmortem. Yeah, this is postmortem. This is why we're doing. It's a matter of anatomy. Yeah. These structures have different properties. Yeah. The cyber architecture was discovered by Katrine Amutz in Anatomy Without Us. What we've done is try to relate the, the histology to the uh, functional definitions in the brain. And what we've developed is a method to be able to relate these two kinds of measurements. Because you would like to know which part of the histological data set you need to retrieve, right? And we do this in adults because we don't have postmortem data in the children. Ideally, you would compare the face area in a child to the face area of an adult, but unfortunately, and it's a good thing, there is not a lot of postmodern data in children that we can do histology. It's a good question. Thank you for stopping me. Yes? And just to clarify, so uh, we don't have these regions functionally defined in the adults who died, right? They died like in the mid 90s. So this is just, these are the anatomical. Yeah so, yeah, so if you're interested, we have a series of papers. This is a paper up there that shows the method of how we related between functional regions and cytoarchitectonic. The cytoarchitectonic atlas from V1 to, there are four visual regions, V1, V2, V3, V4 on the ventral stream, and four regions, cytoarchitectonic regions on the fusiform gyrus. This is all publicly available, and if you're interested in downloading them, you can align them with your free surfer brain and use these cytoarchitectonic partitions. OK, so if it's not cell bodies, what is it? Maybe it's myelin. Uh, we simulated how much myelin would need to grow uh, in order to account for the quantitative MRI measurements that we measured. And Jesse did a range of simulations with a different a number of axons and voxels with different diameters. And he ended up with axons that look like this, where this is the center of the axon, and this is a myelin sheath. And this doesn't really look like a lot like axons in the real brain, where the axon typically is bigger than the myelin sheath. So while myelin might be a contributing factor to our QMRI measurements, we think that's probably not the only source. Of, so we're really thinking that what is happening is that there is an increase in dendritic or arborization and synapses, and then there might be different anatomical developments across brain regions like V1 and the fusiform gyrus and across lifespan where maybe pruning is happening in the first year of life, but maybe uh, this uh, dendritic growth is happening during uh, your childhood development. Okay, so we find evidence for cortical tissue growth, but what about functional predictions? 
So again, just to remind you, pruning predicts that there is going to be a, res a decrease in response to the non-preferred stimuli. So suppose you measure the selectivity or the responses to faces and other stimulus in the face area in children, and you get some tuning curve because we can identify this region. What the pruning hypothesis predicts that this region initially uh, responds to many stimuli, but as responses get pruned, you get less responses to the irrelevant stimuli like, I don't know, cars and houses and words. However, the growth hypothesis predicts the opposite, that if this is a tuning curve in the children, what you should expect is no change for the irrelevant stimuli, but an increase in the response to the relevant stimuli, in this case, faces. So that, again, it's a very easy prediction to measure. We just localize these regions and get independent data and measure the responses to faces and other stuff. And I'm going to show you the result from m faces, but the result is very similar for other face selective regions. We really see no difference in the responses to the non-preferred stimuli, but we get a significant increase in the responses to faces in the face area. So we think that there may be more neurons that are selective to faces in children than in adults. Yes? So your selectivity um, index in the previous plot, was, yeah. was that based on The selectivity is a T value showing the difference between uh, faces and all the non face stimuli, all of them, uh, and divided by the standard as a standard deviation from the residual error of the GLM. So we, are, we have 10 stimuli, 10 categories in our experiment, so we use all of them. Okay, so basically the first, uh, I hope I get to the other two parts of my study, but the first part of the study uh, shows is that during childhood there is a, a macromolecular tissue growth in face selective regions, and this change in the tissue structure is associated with both increased responses and selectivity to faces and concomitant improved face recognition uh, properties. Yes? Mm -hmm. So why it is that that babies can recognize a wide of a variety of faces, including animal faces, and so forth, compared to adults who can't, and you can't train people, where it's very difficult. So this is a really good question. We have a study that I actually didn't put here in the slides, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it more, but I'm just going to give you the gist. So these measurements are not very good to measure sensitivity to identity. So what we did is we have a separate study that I did with Vaidehina 2. We use an fMRI, paradation, uh, FMRI adaptation paradigm where we measured uh, the sensitivity to faces. So basically what you do is you um, vary the degree of dissimilarity among sim stimuli and measures the recovery from adaptation in MRI. And in the same time, we also did a perceptual experiment outside the scanner measuring the sensitivity to a perceptual identity. And what you see is that you get an increase in sensitivity uh, to face identity, but it is still coupled with overall increased responsiveness to faces. So we do see uh, sensitivity to identity improving, and the improvement in, in the neural sensitivity is coupled with improved uh, perceptual sensitivity. But that doesn't mean that it has to be through a pruning mechanism. What we think is, is actually happening is as the neurons basically in your uh, uh, fusiform pull information from other neurons, you could have maybe a more refined weighting of different faces, and that gets you this perceptual enhancement. It doesn't have to be because you're getting rid of stuff. You could actually use your weights in, a, in an intelligent way, so to speak, uh, as a brain, basically, to refine your representations. Yeah, I was talking about in terms of narrowing. You lose the ability to recognize faces, uh, like animal faces and monkey faces. So we didn't test animal faces and monkey faces, but you do be, you better, you become better at distinguishing between human identities, and that's both for little humans and big humans. So this we did look at age effects. Okay, so because we saw this increase in dendritic pooling, or we hypothesized this, this might affect receptive fields in the visual system, because you might think that the basis of a spatial increase in the receptive field size is about spatial pooling. So the next study I want to describe to you is uh, how do receptive fields develop from childhood to adulthood. So for those of you who are not visual scientists, uh, the visual system's uh, basic computation is performed by receptive fields. And the definition of the receptive field is a region in visual space that is processed by a neuron. 
Now, with fMRI, we cannot measure single neurons, but luckily for us, there is a feature of the brain that's useful, is that neurons with similar receptive fields are physically clustered. The clustering is in the range of millimeters. So what we can do is measure with fMRI the population receptive field, or that is a receptive field by the population of neurons in a voxel. And basically, for each voxel in the brain, we independently uh, model and map their population receptive field. And our model of the population receptive field is at a region in space that's modeled by a two-dimensional Gaussian with a compressive nonlinearity. So, so we fit this model for every voxel, and then that lets us compare across voxels, across regions, and across people. So just to give you an intuition about what are the sizes of receptive fields that we can measure and how they relate to real-life stimuli. So suppose you're looking at a face about a meter, a meter and a half away from you, and you're measuring a receptive field in V1 that's two uh, degrees off the fovea, you'll see that V1 receptive fields are really small, and basically that means that they only code local information, maybe something like the edge of the eye. And a very known feature of the hierarchy of the ventral stream is as you ascend the hierarchy, receptive fields increase in size, and we can see this increase in size with our MRI measurements. For example, a two-degree receptive field in V4, that's an intermediate area in the hierarchy, will code maybe a, a, a facial feature or a few facial features like an eye and an eyebrow. And when we measured receptive fields uh, in adults, this is an experiment I did with uh, Kendrick Kay and Kevin and Weiner, we found that the face selective regions, the receptive fields are even bigger. So by the time that you're at the end of the ventral stream hierarchy, your receptive fields in the face selective regions might be so big that they could encompass a, a large portion of the face or even a whole face. Another thing that we might, you might ask, well, maybe spatial coding is not happening by one receptive field, but maybe by the, to, the receptive fields of the whole area. So another kind of plot I'm going to show you today is what we call visual field coverage, and that means how much of the visual space does a collection of all the receptive fields in an area cover? So again, I'm going to start with V1. So V1's, uh, this is, the top shows each receptive field, the red is the center and the um, you can't hide, so just see the gray are the receptive field sizes, and we overlay them, and this shows you how they tile the visual field. So what is well known about visual cortex is that each hemisphere has a representation of half the visual world, and you can measure it. For example, right V1 has a coverage of the left side of the visual field, and of course, left V1 will have the coverage of the right visual field. If you look at the visual field coverage in face selective regions, you'll find that they have what we call a foveal bias. And this is illustrated in both plots. So first of all, you can see that different than V1, where receptive field centers are scattered all across the visual field, oops, receptive field uh, uh, centers in the face selective regions are close to the fovea. Second of all, because they're big, uh, almost all of the receptive fields cover the fovea. And if you look at the visual field coverage in the space selective regions, uh, it first extends to the ipsilateral visual field, but you can see that there is a much more denser coverage of the fovea compared to the periphery. And this might actually be useful for face recognition because when you look at faces, you typically fixate at the center of the face, and that lets a, a processing power of your face-selective neurons co uh, code information across both sides of the face and integrate across facial features, and this might be a basis for holistic processing that's necessary in face recognition. So now that you have a little bit of a gist about what to expect about receptive fields in the visual system, how do they differ across children and adults? So I'm going to describe an experiment that we did PRF mapping in children and adults and measured receptive fields across visual cortex. So we adapted our uh, traveling wave experiment to be more child-friendly. So instead of a boring fixation, we have a spaceship. The spaceship has to take Dot, our alien, to his planet. As the spaceship often runs out of gas, so it turns red, you have to press a button. So children can do this task, They're, they like it, they can get to 100% of the task. Of course, we don't trust our participants, so we measure their eye movements. Uh, and you can see that children can do a really good job at fixating, and this is going to be key for us to be able to measure retinotopic responses uh, in our participants. So the first thing that we did is we, oops, this is not seen, okay, never mind. Um, we measured receptive field sizes across the ventral visual field hierarchy. So these are all the retinotopic regions from V1, V2, V3, V4 to V1. The lighter color are children, the darker color 
uh, are adults, and this is a median re uh, receptive field size across participants. So as I showed you before, receptive field size on average increases across the ventral hierarchy, but there are no significant differences in the mean receptive field sizes across children and adults. So, um, and if you look also at the mean uh, PRF uh, eccentricity across these retinotopic areas, you can see that there are no significant differences in children and adults. And not surprisingly, since we don't get changes in size or eccentricity, we also don't get um, differences in visual field coverage in early visual cortex. Now I'm showing you the left hemisphere, so you can see the coverage in the right visual field, and you can see across all the ventral stream, both children and adults have a really nice hemifield coverage in early and intermediate uh, retinotopic areas. So it looks like by the age of five, we get uh, adult-like retinotopic properties in early and intermediate regions of the ventral stream. But what about face and word selective regions that might be still developing in childhood? So this is an example brain, it shows the face selective regions in red, the word selective regions in blue, and you can see that there is this um, lateralization where word selective regions tend to be larger in the left hemisphere, and uh, face selective regions uh, tend to be larger in the right hemisphere, and there's a long literature su suggesting that right hemisphere is dominant for face recognition, and a word uh, recognition is dominant, left hemisphere is dominant for word recognition. So this might be also an opportunity for us to look at hemispheric differences in specialization. So because of shortness of time, I'm going to not show you all the results, but I'm just going to jump directly to the coverage. So uh, here is the average coverage map uh, of the child left uh, word selective region. So you can see this is the left hemisphere, like in early visual cortex, we get this la right lateralization. And you can see that it's actually, it's, there is denser coverage also in the lower visual field. But it does extend all the way to the periphery. But as children develop into adult and more, become more proficient readers, you can see that there's a big change in the visual field coverage, that it becomes much more foveal in adults compared to the children. So this is a dominant hemisphere for words. What happens for faces? In faces, we see the opposite. The child face selective region starts to be with very high foveal coverage. And as children develop, we can see that their coverage recedes and becomes more extended to the periphery. Uh, now, we can look also at so the right hemisphere. So the right hemisphere is a dominant hemisphere for face recognition and not for reading. And here we see the opposite effect. So first of all, we get now coverage of the left visual field as expected, but you can see that in the word selective regions, um, the coverage becomes less foveal from childhood to adulthood, but in the face selective region, the coverage becomes more foveal for childhood to adulthood. So we get this kind of hemispheric by material interactions where you get increases of the foveal bias in the dominant hemisphere for that stimulus. So increase in the foveal bias for faces in the right hemisphere and for words in the left hemisphere. Another uh, change that we see developmentally is the total area covered by receptive fields bilaterally between uh, childhood and adulthood. And if we just measure the total area, we find that there is an increase in the, uh, in the total area covered by receptive fields in both the word and face selective region. And in the face selective regions, we see like a doubling of the visual space covered by receptive fields from childhood to adulthood. And what that means is, again, if you kind of intuitively fixate on a face, the child's face selective region will cover uh, the whole face, so in a glance you could pick up the identity of the face, but uh, uh, in the child uh, uh, PRFs, they'll cover a shorter, a smaller portion of the face. And we looked at this data and we looked at the differences in the coverage plots, and we thought, well, this makes a very interesting uh, prediction. So suppose you and your child are going to the museum and looking at this masterpiece, and you're going to fixate on the center of the uh, systemos, maybe on the nose, and perhaps your eye movements are going to be guided by your dominant hemisphere. So I'm going to put here, the child is looking at the left, the adult is looking at the right. This is a visual field coverage of the right face selective regions. So let's just uh, mark it. So you can see that this is a very non-optimal place of fixating on the face because a lot of the facial features are going to be outside that place. 
If you're adult and you're going to fixate at the same location, I'm going to look at the area that's covered. You can see that with this uh, fixation, the adult will capture the whole face. So what a child needs to do is to fix it, shift their gaze and fixate upward and rightwards to move their visual field coverage on the facial features. So basically, the, what I'm trying to say in other words is that the differences in the visual field coverages between children and adults might have an effect of, of where people should fixate on if they're children or adults. And again, this is a hypothesis, but it's testable. All what you need to do is bring children and adults, the same children that we scanned, uh, into an eye tracking lab and see how they fixate on faces and words. Yeah? I'm making a very specific prediction about eye movements because I'm saying that if you're not going to put the, your visual field coverage on the face, you don't have enough information to process the face. Attention, it could be additional, but I'm really looking right now at eye movements. Okay, so this is an example face. So again, this is an eye tracking lab, and people are seeing a bunch of faces and other stimuli, and then they get a surprise recognition memory test, and they're allowed to free view the face while they're doing the test. And what we're measuring here is the density of fixation. Uh, and this is shown on this particular stimulus, how adults on average fixated on the face and how children fixated on the face. And you can see that adults fixate at the center of the face, and a ch child on this face seem to be fixating upwards and rightwards as we predicted. So we can measure this because we have many stimuli and they're not all the same size uh, or location. So what we can do, we measure the center of mass of the adult fixation, we measure the center of mass of the child fixation, and we have a vector showing how the eye movement of the children might be different, the fixations of the children might be different than adults. And across all the 16 different stimuli that we use, we find a significant bias that children fixate rightward and upwards compared to adults. And basically what that does, it puts their visual field coverage on the informative location on the face. And importantly, they never fixate downwards and leftwards, which would shift their visual field coverage even more off the face. We did this, of course, also for words. So this is our example word. You can see, again, adults tend to fixate on the center of the words. And in words, they remember the bias was right word and lower visual field. So the sh children should sh shift upwards and leftward. And again, this is what we see. You can see this is an example. And again, across all stimuli, we get this um, shift that children s systematically look at words leftwards and upwards compared to um, children. Yes. I also wonder, because uh, we have other behavioral phenomena associated with it, for example, um, uh, uh, face recognition with respect to scale. Um, okay. yeah. So, for example, are you aware of are more or less accurate with distance? So, we haven't, did, 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 we haven't tested this, but I think there has to be a limit to this because. You know, the prediction would be that children would be better at small faces, for example, than adults. And I think it's, this is a testable hypothesis. I don't know. We haven't done it. But there's going to be a scale where this, if the faces are really small, like within one degree, that because of crowding effects within the face, that's going to make it impossible. So there has to be this kind of balance between being able to get some information from the features and also integrate across the features. We do see some changes in the uh, receptive field sizes. They do become a little bit bigger, but the effect on the visual coverage are just much more pronounced because I think it's not only about the size of the receptive field, but how they tile the visual field that really gives you information across the field. So I don't really, I'm not the kind of person that thinks you recognize a face with your grandmother neuron. And I think the reason that you have a, a large population of face neurons is that they give you this population uh, response. Yes. This was not crazy in a good way. Um, and I have two questions. Yeah. Um, the first, I'll try to be fast. The first is um, if you look at individual trials where the children are fixating, does that predict their recognition performance? Uh, we haven't done this in the house yet. Uh, but, and I don't know that we have enough data because we have like 16 faces. So, right. Yeah. So I don't know. Somebody has asked me, and this is something that we should do, is looking at individual differences. So there are slight individual differences uh, uh, on the 
visual field coverage in. There are definitely individual differences in performance. And basically what we're going to do, we're collecting more data, and I would feel more comfortable making any claims about individual differences when I have a larger cohort of particip participants. Second question is about pathology. Um, is it possible that there's just idiosyncratic differences in, in how children fixate, which actually determines visual field coverage? Um, <coughs> So, um, I don't know how much time I have uh, uh, because I have one more data point that I'd like to show you. So, if you don't mind, I'll answer him and then answer the rest at the end. But um, the way I'm thinking about it is, uh, or if, uh, anyway, the way I'm thinking about it is I think it's kind of like a positive feedback loop. So, we think that there is this general eccentricity bias laid on early in development. So in general, you could see that they're like children don't look like a hemifield in the face of active reduce. They have some kind of uh, un uneven coverage. And as you learn where the information is on the face, you learn where to put your fixation, and that would modify your receptive field. Of course, this is a hypothesis. And one of the things that we're doing is we're tracking these people longitudinally. So maybe in a couple of years' time, I could actually be able to see within a child how their performance <laughs> change and how their receptive field changes and see uh, and to make the link. So I think it's a really good question, uh, but I don't have the data right now to answer you. So if you don't mind, I'll, I want to show one more data point I said I think you're going to like. Uh, I hope so. And then, because I don't know if people need to go, and then I'd be happy to talk more about it questions. So basically we see developmental increases in foveal bias in face and word selective regions in the dominant hemisphere that are associated with changing fixation patterns on faces and words respectively. So the last point I want to talk about is how does the visual attributes of the stimuli uh, affect the, the development of the functional topography of human ventral temporal cortex. Um, and what I mean by that is that we find in everybody's this regular organization of faces in the lateral VTC and, and places in the medial VTC, and a lot of scientists have come up with ideas of what might that be. And the common idea is that there might be this proto-organization early in development, and that kind of like the way you interact or view the stimuli, maybe with your foveal vision, is what places uh, faces and places in different regions. So for example, Rafi Malach has shown that face selective regions are within this the um, foveal representation and place selective regions are within this peripheral representation. And again, you typically fixate on faces. This is why it's going to develop over foveal regions, whereas place selective regions, like if you're in a room like this, the place is going to fill your entire visual field and it's going to extend into the periphery. Uh, however, other scientists have, ide have ideas about other proto maps. For example, there's a map, a large scale map of animacy, so maybe this evolutionary coded that you have some specialized uh, hardware for coding animate versus inanimate stimuli. Uh, and another hypothesis is based on low level features that maybe some stimuli are curvy and other stimuli are, uh, are linear, and there's a separation, and again, a large scale map of curved linearity in ventral temporal cortex. And you can see that all of these maps have this lateral medial. Uh, arrangement, so they would predict that faces and places would land in lateral and uh, uh, medial VTC respectively. So we have actually quantified the statistics of faces at a variety of looking distance or houses at a variety of looking distance as they then Faces are foveal and scenes are peripheral. We've quantified had people rate animacy of face pictures and faces are rated to be more uh, animates in places. We've quantified, again, the linearity was uh, the Tutel and Nasser Ips. A curved linearity toolbox, and again, all of these hypotheses would be um, um, consistent with this lateral uh, medial arrangement. So the question is, what we need a stimulus that is going to be intensely experienced in development, um, and would actually predict that something about the visual attributes of the stimulus is, is different in all three dimensions, so that we could predict maybe which of these dimensions is going to constrain the development. So this is Jesse, uh, and he had this crazy idea. Uh, he was afraid to run it by me, but he managed. And he said, I know the perfect stimulus, uh, Pokemon. And I tell you why, this, he had a hard time convincing me. I tell you why it's the perfect stimulus. So when I was a kid, I played it, we, in the mid-90s, Nintendo invented this Game Boy. So it's like this handheld device, kind of the size of an iPhone. It was the 90s, it had really crummy graphics, meaning that the stimuli are very, very pixelated. They're also black and white because they hadn't invented the colorful displays. Uh, they're also small. 
uh, they always appear in the same um, location in the screen, and you get rewarded for individuating these uh, stimuli. So this is an ideal stimuli because we have maybe people who played hours uh, of this game. It's a, as much controlled stimulus that you could get uh, as a vision scientist in a natural setting. And basically, uh, if you're wondering how he came up with this idea, does he have any personal experience? Uh, this is seven-year-old Jesse playing with his uh, Game Boy. So, yes. So basically, the first thing that we did is we actually quantified the statistics of these Pokemon stimuli and see if they differ across uh, from faces and places across these axes. So the Pokemon are really small. They're less than a visual degree. So they are much more foveal, actually, than faces. If you have independent... People rate them, they're uh, rated in between animacy, between faces and places. And if you actually measure how linear or curvy they are, they're actually very, very boxy. So they're actually more linear than seen. So this is great because now each of these axes would predict that if you have intense experience with Pokemon as a child, and there would be an emerging representation in your brain for Pokemon, eccentricity bias would predict that they all come uh, lateral to face regions. Uh, animacy would tell you that they should come online between face and place selective regions, and rectilinearity should predict that they would come uh, in, uh, more medially to place selective regions. So this is our Pokemon experiment. Uh, can we predict the formation of a novel category presentation from the visual statistics of stimuli experienced during childhood? All our participants in the study are adults. They're all young adults. They're all the same age. Some of them are a Pokemon expert, meaning that they played hundreds of hours between the age of five and eight. Uh, and then we have 11 no novices, adults that never uh, um, played the game. And of course, we don't tr trust our subjects. We gave them the Pokemon quiz. And uh, our expert had to be really good at naming Pokemon. It turned out that they're really good, and our novices can name some of them, but not a lot of them. So this is our Pokemon experiment. You're in the scanner and you see a variety of stimuli. So you have the Pokemon stimuli, uh, you have the faces and places, and then we have a variety of object categories as control. We have other cartoons uh, because they compare to visual similarity. We have uh, other stuff that we normally have in our localizer, and we also have animate stimuli because some of the Pokemon kind of look like animals. So this is just to give you an intuition of how a brain of a novice and a brain of a, a Pokemon expert looks like. This is an unstressed map of face selectivity on the left and place selectivity on the right. And basically, the hotter it is means that it responds more strongly for that category. So we can get this lateral medial arrangement. You can see that uh, in the unstressed eye. So if we look at novices and ask, do they have a Pokemon representation? Mm. Uh, so basically, there are not any really striking voxels that show any selectivity for Pokemon in ventral temporal cortex. But if we look at our expert participant, you can see that there is an emerging representation. It's quite robust, and uh, it seems like it's following uh, in the lateral uh, region. Uh, if you look at the supplements, you can see it for each of our participants. So what we did in order to test our hypothesis, we chunked the ventral temporal cortex into four regions that are, are organized from lateral to medial and measured the mean selectivity to faces, places, and Pokemon and see where that peaks is. So these are our data from our expert. Each line here is, a, is an expert, and this plots the selectivity to Pokemon faces and places across the partitions of ventral temporal cortex. And you can see that for Pokemon, we get the highest selectivity on the most lateral uh, end of the VTC, which has the highest foveal representation. Faces are peaking in the lateral fusiform, a little bit more medial compared to the Pokemon, and places are uh, peaking at the very medial part where we have the far uh, periphery. So uh, these results suggest that consistent viewing experience, and this is tied to your question, the way I have to think about it, that the consistent viewing experience during childhood leads to the formation of long-lasting representation in adulthood, and that eccentricity, the, the visual angle in which you see the stimulus, is a very important attribute that guides the development of these patterns. So I'd like to end here. Uh, I showed you results from three studies. Uh, and um, what these studies show is that during childhood, human ventral temporal cortex undergoes through profound microstructural and functional growth that has visual uh, behavioral implica implications. And uh, that regions associated with central vision, such as the face selective region and word selective regions, show particularly protracted microstructural and functional development. 
uh, and that your viewing experience and your eccentricity bias during childhood constrained the functional development of your ventral temporal cortex. And with that, I will end. Thank you. I've been reluctant to do individual differences because when we have the behavioral data, we don't have all the 25 subjects. So right now I'm working with 15 subjects and just it's too small a sample for me to be comfortable with. But as we're accumulating more data, because we are obtaining this longitudinal data and we're bringing some new subject in, I think we'll have enough data to answer this question. So it, it, it basically... What you're saying, so we can look at individual differences in many different ways. We can look at this at the visual coverage of the dominant hemisphere. We can look at lateral elevation differences. We can look at the overall visual field. And I think this is kind of the direction that we're going to be moving. I'm also really interested in looking at how this changes within an individual. So we're bringing the same participants and we're scanning them over time because I would I think that we'll have higher sensitivity to see if we can see changes within an individual because right now I'm comparing across people. And it's kind of nice, but it's not really satisfying if you're like a developmental psychologist. Yeah, and I guess even, even if you take the behavior out of the picture, and I don't know if you look at it, do you see differences? Um, is there any trend that the changes in the field coverage are all related to changes in the basement? We just haven't looked at it because it's like, it's, I just I feel like I would need to see more data to be able to be comfortable with any conclusion that I make. So we look at each of the individual data, but right now I we haven't really systematically looked at it, and I'm really interested in requiring more data. So ask me in a couple of weeks. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, fascinating work, and I really like the the concept especially. And so I'm wondering. Are you talking about an expert? No, I'm not. So I'm not <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering, you probably looked at this, but do you know what else the mind region yeah. is selected to? How does that so um, we've looked at it. I don't know if I have the slide here or not. Uh, if you look at the Pokemon selective regions, uh, so what we did is, maybe I have this slide here. Uh, we projected it, we made a group map and projected it to the novices and we didn't leave one out in our um, expert, it basically it responds to a animate stem line here. Is this, yeah, this is this graph basically here. So um, this is the, what we took is we take the individual ROIs and make a group map of the Pokemon and then use quantitative face alignment to put it in a subject. So we can do it either for the novices so that they get the group and for our expert we use at least one now. Measurements. So basically, the blue are the expert, the reds are the novices. As we predict, the expert have higher response to this region than the novices for Pokemon. And this is again consistent with this gross hypothesis because we have increases in the Pokemon rather than decreases in other stuff. But you can see that what they respond in novices <coughs> and similarly in expert is actually going to do both cartoons and uh, animates. Similar. Oh, cars and then core. Cores for corridors, because our place is specifically this one where corridors. Yeah, so, yes, the view and the view, yeah. Uh, cool. So, I was really fascinated about the development of the social between your children and your adults, like, for instance, the development of the base region of the state. So, you're collapsing across your entire 5 to 12 year old generation. You may not have the power to answer this, but do you know if there are any trends across age? So, we have. 
we have enough subjects to separate the children into what we call into children and three teens. So we have a group of five to eight and 10 to 12. For this particular study that I've showed you, we haven't separated them, but for other studies that we've measured cortical sickness, or we've looked at information developments by looking at multi-voxel patterns, uh, or even for like the um, sensitivity to face identity, we kind of see this kind of progressive development. So it's not like a jump, it is a development, and we can see differences between the younger kids and the older kids. Yep. Well, I find really fascinating. I'm trying to understand uh, uh, your developmental story. Sure. Here. So uh, there are relatively small differences in excentricity. So they should probably translate in some acuity costs. So we know that acuity drops off exponentially with eccentricity, but these are really small differences. So do we know the acuity costs that would be Small differences in what? So uh, uh, adults tend to forget, and children uh, tend to uh, close. Here's uh, this one. Have eccentricity. Yeah. So, because of this eccentricity bias, okay. presumably there are tiny They're not tiny. In acuity. I'm just asking, I what acuity? is the acuity cost? Okay, so first of all, the question is what is like the bottleneck for acuity? So, I think the bottleneck in acuity is probably going to be initially in the retina, and uh, later on maybe in V1, because this is where you have the smallest receptive field. If we look at data in the literature, the retina still develops maybe up to four months old, and like visual acuity, people think that you see 20, 20 when you're about six, which which is a, basically the age you start learning to read. So um, this is why we also looked at um, retinotopy starting from V1 because we weren't sure, like, if we're going to look at developmental effect, maybe there's still changes that are happening. Some of our children are like five. Maybe we would see things that would translate to changes in V1. And we can't see, at least with our measurements, we can't, we can't see these differences. And this is consistent with having full acuity at the age ranges that we're looking Sorry, at. Sorry, that wasn't my question. My question was, if you <coughs> move something yeah. out of the phobia, there is acuity cost. Yeah. So, right? And okay. so my question is, is this eccentricity enough to result in any meaningful acuity cost so that we would be able to explain differences in face recognition? Okay, so it depends a lot on the test. We've measured it in adults. So if I, uh, we've taken seeing how people perform out to 20 degree out. So if you just ask them if it's a face or not a face, even if you put a face yes. or a house, yes. They can go all the way to 20 degrees. So there's no acuity cost. Where you get an acuity cost is where you are um, doing like identity recognition. And identity recognition, if you go beyond 10 degrees, people are pretty much a chance. These effects are not all the way at 10 degrees. So this whole visual field that I showed you is within the central seven uh, degrees. So uh, right now we're trying to measure this on a larger uh, field of view and we haven't seen if there are any differences between children and adults because we haven't measured it in their ability to do identity faces. It's going to be tricky because in the center, adults are much better than children. So uh, basically, this we've measured to death. So adults are just much better at recognizing faces, whether they're children faces or adult faces. So the baselines already start in a different place. All right, when we talk, I will tell you that you can train uh, children easily to focus centrally, so it would be interesting to see whether you will achieve better recognition. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, thank you guys.